welcome to our second live show of the Wicked Awesome Sports Show. Um, I'm Tanya Ray Fox. This is my co-host Mike Kane, and we're gonna joining us starting out is gonna be Joe Morgan. So welcome to the show. All right. So this is the part of the show where there should be an opening. There we go. Right. That was good, guys. That was good. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, that was good. Um, we're still learning. They're still learning. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I am proud to announce that we are one of the first uh, TV shows of all time that take phone calls. So um, if you have a phone um, of the cellular variety, the wall variety, we take calls. So it's... Um, we're still working on it. It's still like a new sort of thing, but you can call in, ask us questions. And um, our first guest, um, I am proud to say, all the way from Walpole, Massachusetts, Joe Morgan. Right. Wow. Well, thanks, thanks for being here. Okay, thanks, why not? Thanks for being here. First thing I have to ask is 6-2 um, and even. Six to an even. Yeah, I have to ask. And we, we, we asked people, that we, we said, you know, what do you want me to ask Joe Morgan? And I didn't even get questions. They, they didn't even write, well, ask about, they just, I just got six to an even was the answer that I got. So I have to ask you. You want the long or the short version? I want the long version. All right. I played for a manager named Joe Schultz, and he always said that. And I s said, what does that mean, Joe? He said, it doesn't mean anything. So when I first said it, I saw the writers that kind of shaking their head a little. So I got a lot of mileage out of it. But after I get out of baseball, I saw it in a Kentucky Derby program, and it said six, two, and even is a bookmaker's turn on, on the backstretch. But it still didn't say what it was. Well, years later, I talked to a bookie down in Atlanta who was about 93. And I said, have you ever heard the term six, two, and even? He says, yes, I have. That's what we called in the 20s and 30s when we were booking horses. If a horse was even money or four to five, we'd call it a six, two, and even bet. So there you have it. Wow. All right. So everybody that's watching, there you have it. So uh, You'll never remember that, I know. But that's well, we it. have you on tape. That's an exclusive, though. That's an exclusive. Okay. Yeah, well, you heard it first here, guys. Yeah. Um, well, obviously everybody knows you for managing the 1988 Red Sox, um, but you also managed the Pawtucket Red Sox down at McCoy Stadium um, in the early 80s. Um, how was it managing those young kids? Um, it's you a know. lot of fun. You teach them a lot. Everybody in the minor leagues is in the same boat. They want to get to the big leagues. The umpires, the players, the coaches, the whole bit. So it's, it's pretty good along those lines. And, there, there was no better fun than helping a young kid play ball and eventually do it in the big leagues. That's yeah. the thing I liked about coaching. And you had um, a young kid from Nebraska down in Pawtucket, Wade Boggs. You coached, you managed him, Wade Boggs. I mean, how was he? Was he not too shabby down in Pawtucket? Well, he was a great hitter, and uh, he wasn't that good a fielder in the minor leagues, but he made himself a good fielder in the big leagues, which doesn't happen too often. I remember one time uh, his dad asked me, when is my boy going to get to the big leagues? Because he spent quite a while in the minors. I said, nobody wants a singles hitting third baseman. <laughs> and he said, you know what? I've been telling my son that for years, but he proved us all wrong. He really did. <laughs> That's he for really sure. did. Not too shabby. Um, so Wade Boggs and yourself, you were all involved in the legendary Longest game in professional baseball history, 33 innings, um, eight and a half hours over two days. Um, I, I, I just need to ask you this. When in that game did you just say, I don't care who wins? 
I just want to go home and go to bed. Well, I mean, there must have been a time where you're just like, you know what, let's just all go home. We were definitely praying for one team to get a run. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anybody really cared who <laughs> team won. Really, you're right there. <laughs> uh, so in the, you didn't last the whole game. I got kicked out in the 23rd <laughs> inning game. I mean, the 23rd inning. I'll tell you why. The umpire is a local guy from around Worcester. And he had his grandson there that day, the first time the kid had ever seen a game. And he was sitting up there all these hours, and, and the umpire got a little anxious. So he bounced me out of there. For, I didn't even swear at him. <laughs> <laughs> That was the greatest part about it. Never said a swear to him. So did, did you get to go home? Or no, I went. I looked through the hole in the wall for a while, but that got monotonous because the sand was blowing in my eyes. <laughs> it was a very cold <laughs> night with the wind blowing in, and wasn't much fun. So I retired to the uh, locker room, and the phone rang in the, in the uh, owner's office. It was, it was with my wife. She said, where is Joe? The game's going on. But now she heard me talking in the background, and she thought we were pulling a leg that we were sitting there drinking beer or something. <laughs> so uh, the game ended that night about 8 past 4, and the Irish had a thing they used to say on crisp, uh, Easter morning, which was the next day, the sun would dance in the sky when it came up. Believe me, as I was driving home on Route 1, the sun did not dance in the sky. <laughs> Yeah, that must have been a long game. I heard there was 19 people in the stands, but I mean, I'm sure that's probably more than there really was. I can't imagine anybody was sitting no, there. No, there was about 19. Nine, about 19, <laughs> all right. That's um, and then fast forward a few years, 1988, um, and previously 1988, you were in the Red Sox Major League organization as, you know, first base, third base, bullpen coach, um, the, whole, the whole nine. And then 1988, mid-season, um, obviously the team was probably playing around 500 baseball just not performing well. And I'd say the rest is magic, the rest is history. You took them over and 12 in a row, you got to the playoffs. Um, my question is, when a new manager takes over and you have the same uh, roster, you have the same pitchers, <laughs> you have the same hitters, what makes that difference? Like, what makes them want to listen to you? I don't know, that's the strangest thing about it. But I, the same thing happened with the Milwaukee Braves one time. They uh, changed their managers, and they had players like Henry Aaron and uh, Warren Spahn and guys like They had a terrific club, but they were like ours. They weren't winning. They went 11 in a row, and I played for the guy that was managing th that team who came on, Fred Haney. And uh, when we won 12 games in a row, I became the winningest interim manager in baseball history, <laughs> 12 straight wins. Wow. <clears throat> so, yeah. but that was the irony. They were both great teams and just weren't doing it. Yeah, I mean, that's so much for an interim manager. It was a few seasons, and, you know, it's... And uh, Lou Gorman was your GM. Yeah. Um, now, as a general manager, we, we all know that, you know, general managers, you know, they make trades, they, uh, you know, they pick up players, but how is how was Lou Gorman as far as a general manager as far as your everyday managerial duties was he calling you every day so no, he was very good he never told me who to play or not to play he'd ask me if I want a player or not and that was about it some some general managers uh, probably keep him up all night calling him but not Lou he was very good at that wow yeah I can, I can imagine I mean n nowadays you always hear about the general managers being very involved with their managers. We all, I think we only disagreed on one guy that he got. Remember that uh, guy from uh, the Dodgers, Marshall, the outfielder? Yep. I didn't want him, but Lou wanted him, and Lou got him, so he helped us a little bit. All right, all right. Um, so you follow the Red Sox now. Yeah. You know, um, they had a disappointing season. It was, um, we obviously had a few injuries, more than I ever remember ever seeing on a Red Sox team. Um, what do you think they're going to do in the offseason? Do you think they're going to make a splash? Well, number one, those injuries you talk about. I've seen a lot of clubs have that many injuries. But I've never seen a club with guys with two broken feet, broken thumbs, uh, ten cracked ribs. 
It was like they were playing football or something. <laughs> <laughs> they got their work cut out for them at the, uh, in this winter, though. Yeah. And we've got our tees back, but there's a lot of question marks there with Martinez and Beltre, especially if they leave. You've got to replace them. Yeah. I don't worry about the money because it's not mine. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. That's a good way of looking at it. One final question I have to ask you. When you left the Red Sox, um, you were quoted as saying, um, you know, this team is just not good. Like, <laughs> I said they weren't as good as people think. Was I right or okay. wrong? Okay, you were right. Thank you very much. You were right. Um, <laughs> you're right. Um, what, was it almost to light a fire under them? Because when you left, I mean, I'm sure they were probably thinking, you know, who's he think he is telling us we're not good? Or were they really just not good? Well, by that time, they were gone home for the winter. Most of them never even heard it, maybe. <laughs> good point. <laughs> good point. All right. Well, um, thanks for coming. Okay. You know, we appreciate it. Um, and um, before we go, I just want to say that everybody really needs to check out um, the Walpole Scholarship Foundation .org. Um, Everybody knows that Joe does a golf tournament every year, celebrity golf tournament. Um, so it raises a lot of money for the Walpole Scholarship Foundation. Um, so definitely check that out. And um, thanks for watching. We'll be back. Um, Yep, we uh, actually will be rejoining with, uh, we're going to, oh, hey, we're going to be rejoining with uh, Celtics Talk. So tune in after the break and I'll be back with Brian and Phil. At Roster, we know it can be a tall order finding something stylish to represent your team. At Roster, we carry only the best sports lifestyle apparel. So visit us today to upgrade your game gear to the next level. Roster is the only place where you can find labels such as 47 Brand, Mitchell & Ness, Originals by Adidas, Touch by Alyssa Milano, and more. Roster is a local company. We support our local teams. So upgrade your game gear at Roster and look better than this guy. Roster. Sports. Life. Style.